Okay, just give me a second to get set here. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just have a few items at the top, and then I'd be happy to take your questions. So as you know, um, Secretary Austin is traveling right now in Germany. He met uh, this morning with German Defense Minister Boris Pistorius to discuss a range of issues, um, including our bilateral defense relationships and security assistance to Ukraine. We should have a readout forthcoming that will be posted online at defense.gov. Additionally, tomorrow the Secretary will convene the eighth se session of the Ukraine Defense Contact Group at the Ramstein, Ramstein Air Base. The contact group has been instrumental in identifying, synchronizing, and ensuring the delivery of military capabilities the Ukrainians need to defend their homeland against Russian aggression. The Secretary looks forward to meeting with defense leaders from approximately 50 nations that comprise this important group dedicated to Ukraine's self-defense. And finally, um, you might have seen that the Secretary um, in his bilateral meeting this morning also said a few words about this, but on behalf of the Department, would just like to echo the Secretary's sorrow and offer our deepest condolences over the helicopter crash near Kyiv um, that took the lives of more than a dozen people, including Ukraine's uh, Interior Minister, Denis Monasterski. And with that, um, I will take your questions. I'll turn over to Tara Kopp. Okay, uh, two. First, um, Yesterday, the Coast Guard put out a tweet on a Russian intelligence ship operating off the coast of Hawaii. Um, is the department concerned about this? Has there been any sort of communication with the ship? And, you know, this is a fairly routine. There are Russian spy ships that end up on the U.S. coastline frequently. But is there a bigger concern now because of the Ukraine war? Well, you know, I, I can't say, I, I can't speak to, to why the Russians um, are, are sailing this ship right now. Um, it's kind of precarious timing, but um, I would say that the Coast Guard is still is monitoring this um, Russian vessel that's um, we believe is an intelligence gathering vessel, but is operating in international and open waters. We haven't seen any unsafe or unprofessional um, uh, behavior, and um, we expect that the Russians will um, uh, operate within the region in accordance with international law. But for any, in terms of interaction with the with the vessel itself, I would direct you to the Coast Guard. Okay, and second, a uh, different yeah. topic. Um, the Germans have indicated they are hesitant to provide tanks to Ukraine unless the U.S. also provides Abrams. Where are we on those discussions, and what is the likelihood that you know Abrams would be sent in order to, um, I guess, work alongside the Germans on this? Well, we're going to have a readout um, from the Secretary's meeting with um, his counterpart, um, uh, Minister of Defense Pistorius, later today. But in terms of the conversations, I think you saw Dr. Call really speak to this yesterday. Um, the Abrams are a—it's more of a sustainment issue. I mean, this is a tank that is— um, requires jet fuel, whereas the Leopard and the um, the Challenger, uh, th it's a different engine. They require diesel. It's um, a little bit easier to maintain. They can maneuver across large portions of territory before they need to refuel. The the maintenance and the, um, the high cost that uh, it would take to maintain an, an Abrams is just it just doesn't make sense to provide that to the Ukrainians at this moment. Um, as you know, we've provided the Bradleys. Um, we're seeing other nations uh, step up and continue to provide um, equipment and material to Ukraine um, that they can. Ultimately, this is Germany's decision. It's their sovereign uh, decision um, on what security assistance they will provide, um, so we won't be able to speak to them. But I think that um, we are certainly doing what we can to support Ukraine in, in what in what they need. Yeah, Warren. Uh, on, on the same topic, a senior defense official said yesterday, traveling uh, with the secretary, that uh, they're optimistic that they will make progress on Germany with tanks by the end of the week. And yet, a senior administration official here tells us Germany's not budging and demands tank for tanks. Are you optimistic that you will see progress by the end of the week with Germany? Um, do you believe that's going to happen, or is it less optimistic at this point? Well, I, you know, I don't have a crystal ball here to say what will or will won't happen by the end of the week. Um, the secretary had a productive conversation um, with his counterpart. The contact group is meeting tomorrow, so I'll leave any further announcements from other countries and other nations and partners and allies to them. Um, but again, you know, we are thankful for what Germany has been able to contribute already. They sent um, infantry fighting vehicles um, and, a, and a Patriot missile battery system to Ukraine. Um, and we're continuing to work with other 
partners and allies around the world to see what else can be provided to Ukraine. And that's that's the whole point of tomorrow's meeting. Yeah. Thanks. And then, sorry, I'll come to this one. Thanks. Sorry. I have two questions. Mm -hmm. um, the first one, so Ukraine's defense minister, Reznikov, said that uh, Ukraine could use U.S. weapons to attack Russia's occupied Crimea. Um, is that concerning to the U.S.? I mean, Crimea is part of Ukraine. Um, we've long held that position. We've said that that is um, we certainly support the Ukrainians taking back their territory by any means that they um, can and what other whatever weapons they are using. So um, again, we have not shied away from stating that fact from the very beginning. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, uh, sorry, did you want to? Yes, certainly. Sure. Um, so the U.S. has requested um, to send munitions from its stockpiles in both Israel and South Korea. Um, why? Well, again, I mean, we are supplying Ukraine um, pretty regularly with uh, different ammunitions, materials, capabilities, and equipment. Um, and part of that is making sure that we can um, do so quickly. And um, we have been working with um, ROC and Israel when it comes to withdrawing from our stocks and um, communicating that with them. But that doesn't mean it impacts our readiness. That doesn't impact our capabilities um, to protect Americans here at home and, or abroad. And so um, we feel confident on um, on what we have been able to withdraw and what we have been able to get to the Ukrainians. So is the U.S. looking to send those munitions from other its stockpiles in other countries because there's a lack of stockpile here in the U.S.? No, I wouldn't say that. I mean, the secretary has always said we're not going to drop below our readiness levels. Um, but we also have to pull from different um, stockpiles from all around the world. That doesn't mean that, you know, everything is here in the United States or everything is in the UCOM AOR. We have to go to other sources, other places, um, to make sure that Ukraine has what it needs and to also be able to backfill our own stocks and um, work on backfilling partners and allies. I'm going to go to the phones and then I'll come over here. Um, Joe Gould, Defense News. Thanks, Sabrina. Um, with the secretary pressing to have transfers of Le Leopard 2s to Ukraine, obviously countries are going to have to decide for themselves and make their own announcements. But is it the secretary's objective to have a pool of countries, uh, they currently operate the LEO, donating that tank um, and parts and related training? Thanks. Well, there are there are dozens of countries that have um, the Leopard tanks. I think that the secretary's um, objective here is to secure and work with our partners and allies to get Ukraine um, the capabilities and, and the requests that it has um, for what it needs on the battlefield. Um, that's why the contact group is so important. Um, again, tomorrow it's meeting for the eighth time, and these what you see when you when you um, when the contact groups uh, wrap up is usually some announcements from other nations, including the United States, um, on other capabilities and commitments to Ukraine. Um, but again, you know, Germany is just one of many countries that has the capability um, to provide uh, the Leopard tanks. Um, there are other nations out there that have also um, been discussed providing other tanks, and so I'll leave it to them to speak to um, at the contact group tomorrow. Um, I'm going to take one more from the phone, then I'll come back in the room. Alex Horton, Washington Post. Alex, are you there? Uh, thanks. We can hear you. Hey, it's uh, asked and answered, so thanks. Okay. Oh, sorry. Great. Thanks. Okay. Um, I'll come in the room. Yes, Jenny. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for on the redeployment of uh, tactical nuclear weapons into South Korea. Yesterday, the U.S. Uh, Center for Strategic Studies uh, pointed out that South Korea's anxiety over extended deterrence is growing, arguing that the two countries, I mean, uh, U.S. and South Korea, needed to review mock exercise in preparations for the possibility of redeploying low-level nuclear weapons to South Korea at some point in the future. How does the Pentagon view the possibility of deploying tactical nuclear weapons in South Korea? Well, we've been committed and said this from 
uh, for a while that we support the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Um, we've seen North Korea continue to engage in um, destabilizing uh, tests uh, in the last few months, but our commitment to ROC remains ironclad. Uh, we are going to continue to conduct exercises with them, as we do on routine, and not just with ROC, but we've done trilateral exercises before. Um, but our, our commitment, our, our hope, is that there is a complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. But, uh, recently, uh, North Korea declared uh, itself a nuclear power state, and uh, China failed to stop North Korea's nuclear development. Uh, uh, Secretary uh, Austin visit to South Korea next week. Uh, will he uh, discuss these nuclear issues during the, his visit in Seoul? So, um, yes, as you mentioned, he is traveling next week. Uh, or, I'm sorry, not next week, the following week. Um, you know, I'm not going to get ahead of the secretary and what he plans to say on that trip. It's certainly uh, an opportunity to deepen ties within the region. But um, as we get closer to that trip, I'll have more to read out then. But I think what you will hear from the secretary that should be of no surprise is just our deep commitment um, to South Korea and our commitment to the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula um, and our commitment to, you know, continuing to have our, our forces in that AOR. But nothing for you today to preview on that trip. Thank you. Great. Yes. Thanks, Sabrina. Thank um, does the U.S. intend to make its own announcement about a new aid package as part of the contact group meeting um, this week? And if so, uh, should we um, uh, suppose that it's going to track with earlier um, aid packages and have you know armored vehicles or equipment that allow the Ukrainians to like shoot and move on the battlefield, similar to what Dr. Call described yesterday? I feel like you've seen some of the reporting that I've seen out there. Um, I, you know, I'll be completely frank with you. I have nothing to announce here today. We should expect um, a, a, another security package coming soon, but um, still nothing to announce from, from this podium at this moment. Um, not going to get ahead of also what's in that package, but we know that the Ukrainians have continued to ask for one of their main priorities is um, more armored vehicles, uh, air defense systems. And so um, each package, as you've seen, sort of matches um, some of their, their biggest needs and, and um, requests. And so I'd expect with the next package you'd see something like that. Yeah, great. Yes, I'm sorry. I don't think we've met before. No, Laura Haim from French TV. Hi, I'm nice to meet you. I'm following what's happening in Ukraine. Thank okay. you so much to take my question. Sure. Uh, what is your answer to President Zelensky and the Ukrainians who are asking repeatedly for F-16? So we, Ukrainians have asked for, for many, many things. Um, with every uh, aid package that we assemble and put together, we are in close contact with our Ukrainian uh, counterparts. Uh, again, we are providing them what we think they are capable of operating, maintaining, and sustaining. Um, the F-16s is a very complicated system, um, so we have been you know, very careful and, and, and assessing what they need on the battlefield right now, and I think you'll see that in the next package that, that's coming soon. Yeah, Rio. Thank you. Just one quick follow-up on North Korea. Of course. The, does the Pentagon still assess North Korea is ready to conduct a nuclear test at any moment? Our assessment hasn't changed um, since last summer. We've been um, we, we continue to monitor what is what is happening over there in North Korea and I, standing by if, if there should be such a test. I think um, they have shown that they are willing to do a test at any time. Um, and we will be ready to, of course, work with our partners and allies in the region in any response. Do you see any particular reason why North Korea has not done a nuclear test despite the fact that the preparations seems to be completed more than a half year ago? I don't know that I can get in the head of uh, North Korean leaders there. Uh, you'd have to ask them why they have not done the test. I have, I have no reason to indicate either way uh, of a reason. Great. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, so the Turkish Foreign Minister was in Washington D.C. yesterday, and he said that the uh, Greek government is militarizing islands in the Aegean Sea with the help of the United States and deploying U.S. armored vehicles on some of these islands. First of all, can the Department of Defense either confirm or deny this? I would have to look into that. I'm not, I'm not aware of some of this reporting that you're mentioning, um, so I'd be happy to take that question. Does the United States believe that those islands that Ankara is claiming that should remain demilitarized, should remain demilitarized? Well, we're not seeking to um, 
see a conflict in that region. These are NATO allies that we work with uh, uh, frequently. Um, so I, you know, I, I'm not going to speak to that and to speak to an opinion of a different country here from this podium. What I can say is that we'll continue to work with our allies in the region. We have troops stationed very close by. Um, but I, you know, happy to take your first question on that. Uh, just last one sure. question then. Um, can then the Department of Defense say for sure that are there any U.S. armored vehicles, personnel, any U.S. equipment that is belonging to the U.S. military on any islands in the Aegean Sea? Well, I think you just asked that question in your first question. I'll take that question. So yeah, I'd have to get back question. to you. Right. No, I'd have to, I'm going to have to get oh, back okay. to you on that. I just don't have an answer for you from here at this Thank time. You. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. My question is about the U.S.-Japan Security Consultative Committee, so-called 2 plus 2, held last Wednesday. Mm -hmm. The joint statement issued after the meeting didn't mention the need to revise the guidelines for U.S.-Japan Defense Cooperation, which provides a framework of roles and missions of U.S.-Japan alliance. Um, what would be the U.S. position on whether it's necessary to revise these guidelines for U.S.-Japan defense cooperation after Japan changed its strategic documents last year? Well, we were very pleased and welcomed the um, the defense strategy that Japan recently announced just before um, the visit here in the United States. Um, we welcome the release of, of their national security documents, um, and we see that as an opportunity to build on the, the strong alliance um, that bolsters regional deterrence there. And, um, you know, the announcements that were made at the, at the uh, 2 plus 2 just last week, I think, highlight that. Um, we have no plans to update the defense guidelines at this time. Um, but, you know, as you saw uh, uh, last, last week, um, it's a very deep alliance that we have with Japan and looking forward to working with them in the future. Great. I'm going to go to the phones and then I'll come back. Um, uh, Laura Seligman, Politico. Hi, Sabrina. Thanks for doing this. Um, I have two questions. One um, is about the combined arm training in Germany. Is that training going to incorporate these new tweaks from Britain and um, any other countries that may be donating them, as well as the Bradleys? And then uh, my second question is on long range, longer range munitions. Is that something that is still off the table? Um, in terms of your first question, our European allies um, and partners have been doing their own training when it comes to uh, training Ukrainian uh, troops. So our combined arms training is right now just focused on the Bradleys. I don't anticipate that it would incorporate other um, tanks or, or other equipment at this time. Um, but if that changes, you know, I'd, I'd be happy to follow up with you. Um, and then in terms of long-range capabilities, I mean, we've provided the Patriot, as you've seen. We've provided um, Ukrainians with a layered defense um, of air capabilities from short to long range. Um, and the Ukrainians are using those well. They're using them effectively, um, or, and, and especially when the Patriot is in country, they'll be able to knit those together um, to create a very um, uh, highly uh, defensible air um, that uh, I, I think they're, they're doing so effectively as they are right now, but with the Patriot there will be an added capability um, that can help protect uh, major cities and, and, and innocent civilians um, in this war. Um, I'm going to take one more question from the phone. Howard Altman. Yes, thanks. I have a uh, question and I have a uh, request. The question is, the, the Wagner Group claims that it has captured the town of Klitschipka, which is about five miles south of Bakhmut. Can you confirm that and tell me how um, that might affect the defense of Bakhmut and Solodar, and then I have a request. I'm sorry, uh, Howard, you sort of, or for me at least, cut out on what city or town did you mention that was specifically captured? It's, it's, Klitschivka, it's a small town about five miles south of Bakhmut. I see. Okay. Um, I don't have an update on specifically on, on, that, um, on that town, but what I can say is that we're still continuing to see uh, intense fighting on both sides from the Ukrainians and Russians in um, and around uh, Bakhmut and Solodar. Um, it is 
it is uh, blocks to uh, you know kilometers every day that continue to change hands. Um, but the Ukrainians are, are not giving up a, their fight, and neither are the Russians. They're really dug into the ground right now, to the battlefield. Um, and right now, we we know that the weather uh, in Ukraine, the the um, it is icy, it is uh, wintry, so the roads are are um, or the ground is a bit more frozen over, uh, which allows for uh, vehicles to move around a, a, a bit more uh, with more maneuverability. But again, this is a grinding um, fight that we're seeing in the east, and um, I, I don't have more really more to update you on that. It just continues to be um, a, a grinding fight. Um, I'll take, sorry, I'll take one more from the phone here. Jeff Shogel, Task and Purpose. Can, you, can the Pentagon do something about providing uh, communications for those of us who are not in the uh, building during the time that the PBR is closed? I mean, you got a budget of $800 billion. Uh, is there any way to find some money on their couch or something to provide, you know, secure communications so that we can participate in uh, briefings going forward? Jeff, I'll have to get back to you on that one. I um, I know that we are doing some updates to this uh, lovely Pentagon briefing room, um, and you know we'll follow up with you offline on that. Um, I'll come back into the room. Yeah, Brandy. Thanks, Sabrina. Um, I have a follow up on Ukraine, and then a question on a new topic. Okay. Uh, on Ukraine, um, did Doctor Call meet with, or was Secretary Austin supposed to meet with any of the Ukrainian officials, um, the internal ministers who perished in the helicopter crash, and did that affect? the contact group meeting in any way? I am not aware that it, it affected the contact group. I mean, the contact group was going forward, but of course we offer our deepest condolences. Um, as, as we've seen the reports that more than a dozen people were killed and um, many more injured, so I, I wouldn't be able to say any, anything more than that. Okay, thank you. And then mm -hmm. um, this is sort of a two-in-one. Politico reported uh, that Pentagon officials and officials from other agencies are attending an event hosted by NASA right now, I think, this week um, on their ongoing UAP investigations. Mm -hmm. um, and they reported that uh, DOD's Aero office has partnered with Enigma Labs, a startup that uses machine learning to make sense of UFO data. And so can you tell us um, who from the Pentagon is attending that NASA event and what does DOD aim to get out of this new partnership with Enigma Labs? I would have to take that question. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have the answers for you on that one, so I'll, I'll, I'll take that and get back to you. Yeah, over here. Hi. Uh, I have a question on Ukraine and the Japan question. Okay. Um, <clears throat> earlier this week, the Netherlands announced that they're also sending a Patriot battery, so that makes three. Is going to the, UT the contact group meeting tomorrow, is the U.S. going to be scouring, trying to get other operators to um, donate more batteries? And how is th that discussion focusing on training? as the U.S. worked out with the Netherlands to provide more training inside the U.S.? Well, I don't want to get ahead of the discussions that are happening tomorrow, as you just mentioned. Um, I, th I think we welcome any additional commitment when it comes to giving Ukraine more air defense capability from any country or any partner. Um, and so in terms of the training and, and whether our, our teams would train on the, the a, a Patriot battery provided by the Netherlands, I just don't have an answer for you on that. Um, many countries do conduct their own training, as we've seen from the beginning of this war. So um, I think what the Secretary is looking for tomorrow is um, further commitments from other partners and allies to help Ukraine. Um, and that is up to those sovereign states to decide what, what commitments they can give. But of course, we know that air capability is one of them, or air defense is one of them. Do you know if they're all, the three committed ones are all the same variant? All I don't. I don't know. Okay. And on Japan, yeah. do you, sorry. Oh. Um, in the meetings last week, we had heard about the Marine, new Marine re uh, Regiment in Okinawa. Yep. At the same time, the Air Force has pulled out its F-15 unit at, in Kadena. Do you know if that came up in the discussions, the future of the U.S. air presence in Okinawa? Um, I, don't, I don't know that that came up, but I think that you saw last week the deep commitment that we have to the region, um, and part of that was uh, was discussed in the Secretary's meeting and the Secretary of State's meeting at, at um, the Department of State. So um, that does not impact the relationship or the readiness or the um, threat uh, in that region. Yeah. I just, not, quick, okay, yeah. Thanks. I just had a quick follow-up on an earlier question about the combined arms training of the Ukrainians yeah. in Europe. Um, I'm not sure anybody from the podium has 
confirmed whether that's begun or not? It has confirmed? begun. It has begun. Yeah. You can confirm that? Okay. Yep, it has begun. Um, it's about uh, five to 600 Ukrainians that are being trained um, in Grafenvir, and um, that, I believe, uh, started uh, this weekend, just this past weekend. Yes. Yeah, so um, on, on long-range munitions, you mentioned Patriots in your answer. So it's, uh, um, it's man, Patriots are surface-to-air defensive missiles. But can we, can you confirm that uh, longer range surface to surface missiles with more offensive capabilities are on the table or off the table? Well, I have I'm not going to confirm anything. We haven't taken as these contact groups and as these uh, presidential drawdown authorities packages come together. Nothing is on or off the table. It's a discussion that we have here at the department and across the interagency to determine um, what the Ukrainians need and to also uh, maintain our own readiness. So I just don't have anything further to add at that point. And also on, on Crimea, you say you didn't specifically mention that United States, because the story is coming out, that United States um, and Ukraine are discussing a potential Ukrainian plan for taking on Crimea. But you said, OK, Crimea is a part of Ukraine, and Generically, United States supports Ukraine taking back its territory. Specifically, is there any kind of U.S. advice uh, with respect to taking on, with respect to uh, launching an offensive on Crimea to take back the territory from Russians? Are you asking if we cons if the Ukrainians are consulting with us? If you give your advice, endorse such an operation on Crimea. Well, we don't dictate to the Ukrainians how to run their operations. Um, that has been said by multiple people here at this department. Uh, the Ukrainians make the decisions about their operations and when they conduct them. Crimea is part of Ukraine. We've made that very clear from the beginning. If they decide to conduct an operation within Crimea, they are well in their bounds. That is a that is a sovereign part of their country that was illegally invaded by Russia in 2014. They have every right to take that back. And the United States is also ready to support that operation on that specific chunk of land. Well, I mean, what do you mean by support their operation? We're not on the ground. There are no boots on the ground there. So what do you what do you mean? Militarily, whatever capability needed to take that chunk of uh, peninsula back from Russians, the United States is going to be there. Is that you have seen the United States be there for Ukraine, and the uh, this department has said that we will be with Ukraine for as long as it takes. If that includes an operation in Crimea, that is a that is a sovereign part of their country, and they have every right to to take that back. I'll take one more, and then we'll wrap up. Jared yeah. Zimmer with Al Walker. I just want to ask real quick on the subject of air defense uh, batteries for Ukraine. It was reported last month uh, that the U.S. would seek to source NASAMs from uh, from the Middle East. I'm just wondering if there's any deliberation in the department or any effort underway to source additional air defense assets from from that region. Um, I, I wouldn't comment on where we're, we're sourcing some of this. I mean, the, the NASAMs were part of our USAI package. Um, so those go under contract and um, then get delivered into Ukraine. They're already two operating uh, right now in Ukraine. I believe our commitment has been um, a total of eight. Um, so I just wouldn't be able to comment any further on that. And if I could just ask, mm -hmm. um, the National Security Advisor was in Israel, uh, I think probably still is um, at the moment, um, to discuss uh, topping the agenda, the, you know, threats by Iran. I'm um, just wondering, it, it was mentioned uh, previously that uh, one of the issues that were going to be discussed was tactical differences with the Israelis um, on how to deal with the same strategic threat of an Iranian nuclear weapon. I'm wondering if you could tell us anything about those tactical differences uh, and whether the department has been informed if there's been any progress from those discussions. I, I would direct you to the White House. As you just mentioned, um, Mr. Sullivan is there now. I would direct you to the White House for further comment. Okay, great. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, Louis. Yeah. I'll take one more. Fine. Um, so at the previous briefing, General Ryder took a lot of questions about the back pay issue mm -hmm. uh, with COVID. Has there been any progress on that? And also, um, I mean, one question I think is, did the Secretary ever consider um, whether to enable back pay for service members uh, who refuse to take the vaccine? I, I mean, as a matter of policy, DOD is not reviewing um, or is not, is not going to implement uh, a, a policy of providing back pay to service members um, who are separated for refusing the vaccine. So nothing has changed since um, what General Ryder said on Tuesday. But, you know, there was quite a long period of time between the passing of the signing of the legislation and when the guidance eventually came out. Um, so did the secretary ever consider during that time 
whether to facilitate as part of the review process, whether to enable back pay for our service members. Again, providing back pay for service members that were separated from um, uh, the department for refusing to take the vaccine was not something that was under consideration, um, and that's not something that is our current policy. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. Oh, oh, do we have? Okay. We okay. Just one, one last question All right. on Crimea. Um, what is the strategic significance of recapturing that for Ukraine? Well, I mean, I think you'd have to ask the Ukrainians uh, uh, that. I mean, th that's part of their country. Um, it's a, a part of their country that was taken um, by Russia. So um, in terms of the significance that they see, I, I would direct you to them. But from an objective standpoint, I think it's pretty clear that recapturing part of um, their sovereign state is um, is something that would send a, a huge message to, to, to Russia. Okay, great. Thank you all.